it's always hard. I think anybody who knows anybody with addiction, it's always hard. It's always a difficult, you know, sort of open wound that you're constantly tending to. You made me think while you, you were talking, uh, I meant to ask you, ask you this in the first half of the podcast, so I'll, I'll come back to it. Um, I brought up your brother and, and how very personally you wrote about him in, in One Life in your, in your uh, memoir. Um, Cause you'd said in there at the time, like you hadn't really seen him in a while. Have you, mm-hmm. I know it's been a pandemic, but had you been able to see him in any space, like in, in, in recent years, I guess. The last time I saw him was last fall. It must have been August or so, August or September. We had a game out in LA after the World Cup, um, I think in Pasadena. So I saw him then. I haven't seen him since. My family had seen him after that. Um, he had come up to Reading, where we're all from, but I haven't seen him since then. Mm. Um, going through that ex- experience and journey with him, um, uh, would you say like you're – you know, there was obviously an impact on your relationship anytime it is when you're dealing with an addict. But um, in your later years, as you thought more about that relationship, what do you think about maybe differently now than maybe you did at the time that you were going through it? Oh my gosh. I mean, I feel like I understand, you know, addiction, not only so much more, but in such a different way. I think when I was younger, you know, we were 10, my sister and I, we were 10 when we kind of found out, you know, what was happening and all that. So you're confused, you're upset. I think I was really angry with him for a long time of like, why would you make these choices to hurt all these people that you love and do do this to yourself? Um, and I think as I've gotten older and started connecting a lot more dots, like it's a, you know, it's a disease, first of all. And of course there's choices in it, but you know, however much pain I feel, Like imagine what that person feels having to live with this disease and and go through it. And I think with my brother too, like, you know, I, I, as I've started to understand more about the criminal justice system and big pharma and the opioid crisis, I'm like, well, yeah, of course, of course, he's one of millions of people who've been caught up in this. And at such a young age to be put in the criminal justice system, because we have such a cruel and punitive system, like he didn't need that. He needed therapy and he needed um, you know, rehab and, and he needed maybe job training or, or an alternate path that he could be on. And instead he got put on this particular path that essentially, uh, very few ever get back from. I mean, if you're a multiple time felon, if you're a drug, drug addict, um, if if you, you know, have all these things on your record, like, what are you supposed to do? Like, seriously, I, I would love for people to tell me the path. I mean, with the exception of being absolutely perfect all the time like you're pretty much set up to fail and so understanding that better while still struggling like how sad it is and how you know I'm I'm scared for him every day um and and worried about him and I you know it's like in the same sense I don't I don't want to enable him in these like you know bad things he's doing but also where's the how do you know when you're helping or when you're enabling or when you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing so I feel just sad in a lot of ways and I think sad for so many people who are ensnared in this and you know I I just think about the opioid crisis and what that's done to our country and how how much not people's fault it is who have drug addictions or um, you know who have been ensnared in it but also even if it is their fault like okay (laughs) it's just their fault like we just throw them to the wolves like what kind of society is that? We have, we have such a punitive, like if, if you do this one wrong thing, then that should, you know, define the rest of your life when I think we need to have a much more restorative type of just feeling about, you know, criminal justice and all of that. Um, and obviously the laws need to change and that's a whole nother story. But yeah, it's, it's, it's always hard. I think anybody who knows anybody with addiction, it's always hard. It's always a difficult, you know, sort of open wound that you're constantly tending to. So, um, it, yeah, I'm sure it, it probably isn't lost on you that there's a lot of people uh, who might consider you, despite the fact your career has been extraordinary, they might consider you more of an activist than a, than a soccer player. But there yeah, is, there is a, yeah, like they might consider you that, um, you know, you're, you're one of Time's most, 100 most influential people uh, of the year, and you've received a lot of accolades um, for you, the work you've done in the social justice space. But nevertheless, 
you know, soccer is, is your love and that's what you do. So um, what do you have to tell me about what the, the future holds? I think a lot of people assume 2019, that was, that was probably Megan Rapinoe's final World Cup. Um, but we don't get to write your career and you do. So, um, so where do you stand about um, where your soccer uh, career is right now? You coming back, like what, what, what are we looking forward to here in terms of soccer? Mm -hmm. I mean, this year has been really difficult because I feel like I'm having to, even pre-pandemic, not just having to answer that question. Um, and I think it's a fair question. Like sometimes people get asked about their careers and uh, just cause you're old, you start getting asked about it. But I think it was probably a, a fair question um, for me. So I was already kind of starting to like, okay, how long, obviously I want to go to the Olympics and, and do that, but what's sort of past that. But now with the pandemic, like, you know, eventually like I need to start training with the team again and playing. And we had, you know, our league had uh, the Challenge Cup earlier in the summer, and then they played a few games in the fall. The national team has played a few games. They're heading to the Netherlands to play now. And I'm like, frankly, I really don't feel comfortable or, like, feel okay about, you know, traveling and being around other people. And I think there's safe ways to do it. And we're all just trying to, like, do our best in this moment. And, you know, we've seen bubble situations with NBA and the WNBA. That worked great. Um, NFL's worked less great. MLB worked less great. Hmm. I think NHL did okay. College football is a total mess. Like, you know, it's like people are trying to do things, but I don't know. It just, it feels difficult. So I'm like, I need to play, but you know, I'm, I'm also having these concerns about the virus, but like, eventually you have to decide, are you going to, are you going to, I can't just like show up in June and be like, I'm going to the Olympics, you know, <laughs> that's not going to work. So that question is coming pretty soon. Um, as you know, the world sort of catches on fire, um, even more with COVID, I would like to still keep playing. Um, I still feel really excited about playing. I definitely want to play um, if I can, or at least try to play in this next Olympics. Um, I, I think probably a, a bigger conversation with myself will have to happen after that. Cause that's like, okay, these are the next four years of your life. Like, do you want to do this? Is it something you're interested in? Um, or does it even feel right? But I think for now I want to, um, and that's kind of the, the plan. And that'll be, you know, sort of what all my decisions are informed on but I really do love doing all the other stuff that I do as well and I think part of my frustration with the whole like the whole situation really is that because I don't make that much from playing for the national team and actually like my my money's from soccer specific and I make so much more outside of soccer that's messed up like I shouldn't have to feel like I have to do all of this other stuff in order to, you know, capitalize on, on my career. And it's almost like, it's almost like you, you do all this stuff in soccer. You, you train as hard as you can, you sacrifice everything, you do all this stuff to like play the best that you possibly could really to like traditionally like get the contract, but there's no contract to get for us. So it's like, you do all of that only to basically be forced to step a little bit away from soccer because you have to do all these other appearances. And now you're like, your level's going to go down because you can't afford to not take these other opportunities. And so from a financial like security standpoint, like I make so much more doing other stuff than I do actually doing my craft. And so for a female athlete, it, you know, and I think particularly an older one, it's a little bit of a, a quandary I feel. So it's like, how much do you spend on this side of the appearances and even just stuff that I like to do activism and all that kind of stuff. And then how much do I spend actually on my craft? And like, am I just putting everything into my craft while sacrificing my financial future and like security or do I flip flop it? So it, it's tough for female athletes in that way. We never get to play at our best to secure the contract so we can continue to play at our best.